they're safe. Um, safe travel. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Going into uh, today's sermon, I, I first off want to say I feel as though, uh, I mean, it might be joked that, that you know, a short sermon is what's desired so that way you, everyone can eat fried food, which I have mixed emotions about fried food. Really? Scientifically, I know that it cannot be blessed, but somehow it's the best food to always eat. Um, so uh, with it, though, our time just together, the praises, the prayer requests, the, the truth of being a body almost makes me say we don't need a, a sermon. We were already blessed by just being together. The giving and receiving of prayer requests. I was very encouraged just by being there. Um, but with the sermon series through First Thessalonians, there's this conversation about your motivation moving forward and also just your understanding of reality now and reality in the future and how your way that you view the future feeds into how you live today. And another simple way to put it is your motivation usually determines your action. If you are motivated by fear, it causes you to act a certain way. If you're motivated by love, it causes you to act a different way. If you're motivated by hope, or if you are unmotivated, if you're uncertain, it causes you to act different ways. And the reason why I'm bringing motivations up right now is because I want you to think about these things because once we get to 1 Thessalonians 4, it's this complete mixture of your viewing of the future and God's working in the future feeds into how you live the current day. 1 Thessalonians a book is a book that covers the end times, but kind of in a passing sort of way of like, don't get this messed up because you guys are messed up on it. And that's not why I'm preaching through 1 Thessalonians. Um, but I want you to think about motivations as kind of a benchmark and a mindset for this whole entire series. What motivates you? I mean, as a coach, I see athletes that get motivated by, uh, I mean, complete get in their face, yell at them. And then there's athletes that you just say there's no way that you can motivate them and it frustrates you. You see the kids that play their heart out at home because they're in front of their fans. And then when they're out an away game, they do terrible. Um, so maybe we see lots of motivations in the sports realm, but in the realm of life, what motivates you? And hopefully, as we saw this morning, connecting with God and one another should be a good motivation that brings us forward, that moves us forward. Um, but 1 Thessalonians works into this concept of motivation. So read along with me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work, produced by faith, your labor, prompted by love, and your endurance, inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you, came to you not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. We became, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has been known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell us how you, you turned to God from the idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This letter starts off with a very um, seemingly mundane letter reference. I mean, you find 
letters that would start very similar to this all across the Greek world at this time. But Paul makes a couple of little changes that I want us to think about. So he gives the introdu introduction of this being a letter to a church. The church in, Thessal in Thessalonica. Thessalon uh, the city of Thessalonica would have been the biggest city in Macedonia of that time. It's a city that had existed for a few hundred years. It's a really special city. It was a free city. It was inside of the Roman Empire. It was just massive. It was founded. It was named after Alexander the Great's half-sister. I mean, it has this deep, rich history. But he's saying to the church of God in Thessalonica. So he's addressing it to this group of people that have a separate and distinct identity from everyone else living in that city. And I bring this up from a standpoint that whenever you and I see each other, I want to remind you of something that I've said before and will say again and again and again. We have more in common with the believer on anywhere in this world, whether it be Nigeria, India, Russia, the Philippines, or Colombia, than we do with the unbeliever who might be next door to us. Because our identity as being part of the church in God is what brings us and elevates us beyond any geographic location. And I say this as a stern warning and also an encouragement. Your identity will never be shaken if your identity is rooted in being one called by God, chosen of God, and part of the people of God, rather than letting other things identify who you are. But it also goes on and says, God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to not spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to recognize that Paul is intentionally linking Jesus with God the Father, making them equal, meaning Jesus Christ is equal with God. He is God. He has the full authority and weight of God. This doesn't matter as much on the surface for us, of people who've grown up inside church and worship Jesus and know Jesus, but this would have been a big change for people who turned from idols, where there's a lot of little gods, big gods, other gods, and Jesus might have been lost in the shuffle for them. But I think it goes a long way for us right now as people who may have grown up inside a church or around church and with church to make sure that whenever we think through our faith, we don't separate God the Father from God the Son and God the Holy Spirit from a reality that we recognize God as the eternal, communal, relational, loving trinity. And how that sets an example for how we are to be as a church and people. And I'll dig more into that into future passages that touch on it. But I want this to be a little opening thought, setting our minds on everything that goes. But let, read verses 2 and 3. These are the ones that I really wanted to focus on today. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by your faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things I want to point out about this. But before I get to the faith, hope, and love, and the motivating factors there, I want to bring up, are you practicing a faith that is praising God for others, praising God for the works that they're doing, praising God for the life that they're living. And are you living a life where you can, in good conscience, say what Paul says? We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. You cannot just pray before meals and follow this example. Um, multiple times in the book of First Thessalonians, or the letter of First Thessalonians, the reality of having a life exemplified by prayer, a life of prayerfulness, becomes evident. And oftentimes we operate as a functional atheist in our life 
by wanting prayer to be something that maybe punctuates our life of like, okay, we got to pray, we got to eat, time to pray, or hey, we got to start a service, so let's pray, or you know, we're, we're at an important event, let's pray, rather than prayer being our breath, how we are so in need of God that we are continually praying. But also we are so mindful of how God is operating and working in the world that we are always praising God. Prayer, as mentioned here in verse 2, is, in essence, inhaling God's presence, exhaling God's praises. But are you looking for God in the everyday, in the here and in the now? I am not saying it is simple or easy but if you look at what Paul praises God for and recognizes the people of 1 Thessalonians for, oftentimes those items that might make us turn away from God can be those items that bring us to God in that moment. As we see in verse 6, where Paul said, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Your ability to walk through whatever difficulties you see in life, whether it be persecution, whether it be suffering, are an opportunity to bring someone else's eyes to the Lord because you are staying with the Lord in the midst of your tribulation. So we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. This is a charge. This is a um, this is a spleen shot like Andrew got um, to the church leaders. Are we constantly praising God for those around us, and are we constantly praying for them? It is much easier to send the text to someone complaining about someone or something. It is much easier to watch the news clip frustrated about something than it is to turn to the Lord in genuine prayer. But where do we see the presence of the Lord? In the genuine prayer that we see here by Paul. And he says, We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor produced, prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's... Three pairs here. Well, there, or you'd say there's two pairs. There's work, labor, and endurance. And then there's faith, love, and hope. So I think about what are the factors at play in your life. It is evident to Paul that the Thessalonian church is actively practicing their faith. And actively practicing your faith means, as mentioned in verses 4 through 10, demonstrating a repentance and a turning away from sin. It means actively seeking out who to love, who to help, and who to benefit. It means having a motivation that is pure. And then it also means being long-suffering with a mind set right. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. I want to talk a little bit about work produced by faith. Oftentimes we make false dichotomies or, or false separations inside of our Christian walk. It, as Desiring to make sure that people know that the Lord is the one who is the one who saves, is the one who calls, is the one who regenerates, is the one who brings someone into new life and adopts them as a child, we oftentimes don't emphasize the reality that though your works do not save you, when you are saved, you work. Or to put it differently, um, the proof is in the pudding. I have no idea where that phrase comes from, but we know what it means. There's the evidence of your faith shows that you have faith. It shows what you believe. It shows what you find to be true. It shows 
what is steady and consistent in your life. If you really believe that Jesus is the model by which you should live your life, then you will model your life on him. If you truly believe what Jesus says whenever he talks about loving others, caring for others, providing for others, having everyone be your neighbor, then you live it out. These are works produced by faith. Which goes hand in hand with your labor prompted by love. Do faith and love motivate you towards good deeds towards those around you? Or do you let other things shape and mold how you should be? Now, maybe this is me airing my dirty laundry or me, you know, whatever background. Oftentimes, I think we do the good thing or do the right thing because we want others to view as well. Or we have a fear of things messing up. So then we have to make sure someone's doing the right thing. Paul was moved and praised God because he saw a faith and a love guiding the actions of the Thessalonian church. Now, this is not Paul saying they never messed up in these areas. This is not me saying you should never mess up in these areas. But I want us to think about what motivates you when you do, quote, the right thing. Is it because you feel like you're stuck, that you have to do one thing? Or does it feel like, you know, you have a mold that you have to fall into? Is it because you're afraid of failure? Or is it because you genuinely love Jesus and you love those around you? And I, I've said this time and time again. One of the biggest obstacles towards a genuine love of others is a pride of self. And as I said last week, being deluded by something, a false philosophy that makes you think that it's okay to act in hate, act in anger, act in self-preservation. Because the final thing is it says their endurance was inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I might have just said endurance there, like Charles Barkley. I think I you know, slurred it. Endurance. Um, I'm not a sports analyst yet, so I can't do that. But endurance here is long-suffering, meaning having the reality of suffering, yet being patient inside of it. God's Word, I don't know if it's a... We are guaranteed suffering in our life. We are guaranteed pain and frustration. But we are guaranteed the truth of Jesus Christ being Lord over creation, of having a plan, of the, of the statement that there will come a time when the resurrection of the dead occurs where all of us are caught together with Jesus Christ and he comes and he makes all things new. We have a hope and an assurance that what we see now will not be the final answer. It will not be the final picture. This is what Isaiah shows with the new Jerusalem. This is what Revelation shows with heaven and earth meeting. This is what Ezekiel shows with heaven and earth meeting. This is a continued refrain amongst the prophets. And so the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ is that what we see now is not the final picture. It's not the final word. The final word is not pain. The final word is the resurrected lamb. The lamb who was slain. Think about the disciples. They saw the man that they gave up everything for Embarrassed, humiliated, stripped naked, whipped, flogged, and nailed to a cross and laid in a grave that they didn't own. The 
long suffering. The question, the hope, did he, did he say, will it come to pass? What's going on? The fact that he rose from the grave verified the reality that a bigger reality than what we see right now will happen. A lot of us feel stuck in a Good Friday type situation. Where all we see is pain, death, and frustration. But the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ is what should inspire us to faithfulness in the current moment, to not abandon ship, to not act out, to not lash out but to drive us closer to him, because you know what? He will come back. He will make all things new. He sees you, he knows you, he loves you. He has not abandoned you. In fact, whenever he ascended into heaven, he's, in the time before his ascension, he said, I must go, that I can send the Holy Spirit to be with you. You want the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is something that's referenced here in the next paragraph and referenced in the end. 1 Thessalonians. But I really wanted to sit and meditate on the motivations of faith, hope, and love. What marks a Christian versus a not Christian? A Christian is able to say that Jesus Christ is their cornerstone. He's the one in whom they have faith. He's the one that already accomplished what they need to accomplish. He's the one who's already worked out what they need to work out. He's the one who's already laid out before his people the good works that they should walk in them. He's the one who's created the church and said, you are my workmanship, the one that I'm proud of. He's the one who is going to present us pure before the heavenly Father. That is our faith. And he's the one who then gives us the love to love that person that we have no reason to love. Think about this. The craziness of the gospel is that it acknowledges that there are people out there that you might not on any surface level have a reason to love. Yet, it's so powerful that it breaks down every boundary, every border, every reason, and says that person is your neighbor. Love them as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Who's my neighbor? The gospel says everyone. Faith, hope, love. This is what marks a Christian. This is what made Christianity so powerful and so influential. This is where these people in Macedonia, where it was a, Greek, a free Greek city that also had all the Roman idols and was able, and so what, so check this. How, uh, hopefully, well maybe not hopefully, how many of you have seen the movie Hercules? Whether like the old one or the new cartoon or heard of that myth? All right. How many of you have seen Hercules in New York? Okay, this is a 19, late 1970s Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that probably had a $15 budget. That is amazing. Um, we know the mythology of the Greeks. Where did the Greek gods live? Mount... No, that's... Mount Zion is where the temple was. Oh, oh, Olympus. Olympus! Mount Olympus! Olympus. <laughs> Whew, oh, no. We might have to have some conversations later. Um, <laughs> we're in church. We can make mistakes. And we can be corrected. Um, on a clear day, south from the harbor of Thessalonica, you can see rising above the mist and rising above the clouds. You can see Mount Olympus. So the reality of the city of Thessalonica was they had any and every reason to worship the emperor because he's the one who helped them be a free city, worship the Greek gods, worship all the gods and all the things because they had it good. 
everything about the Thessalonian thinking. They were the capital city of Macedonia. They were awesome. They were on a trade route. They had it going. But the gospel helped these people in this church turn from their idols and worship Jesus Christ. When we think about what makes a Christian a Christian, in the first century, it was the person who didn't bow their knee to the emperor, was able to risk their life and their livelihood to worship only Jesus. It was the one who gave up their books of magic, their books of spells, read through Acts. And it was the person who gave up all their personal distinctions that gave them boundaries against others, but rather, as Paul said, he became as one of all people to bring people in. Not only that, but we have evidence in the first few centuries that inside of the Greek cities, such as Sparta and other areas where, infant, where infanticide existed, it was the Christians who took these uh, abandoned kids and adopted them, raised them as their own. It was inside of these cities where the widows might have also been left to fend for themselves, that churches absorbed them in and provided for them. It was in these first few centuries where the people who had no political power, who had no personal clout, who abandoned these things and instead went and acted in faith, hope, love, and works towards others who were weak, that the evidence of the truth of Jesus was seen. The glory of the gospel, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, is not that it's powerful in its rhetoric, but it's powerful in its truth. It's that it transforms lives, it renews, it reinvigorates, it changes our very motivations and thoughts in this world. When I look at you through the gospel, it's not what I can get from you, but what can I give to you. Through the gospel, I am to call everyone my neighbor. And it's through the gospel that I have the hope that no matter what the day looks like, Jesus is Lord. Oftentimes, we get a messed up theology of how the end will be. And I'll address that more in 1 Thessalonians 4. But what the end should be is that we see Jesus is coming back he will make all things new. Therefore, whatever your current situation is, it is not the end of the story. The pain you feel, the death you see, the sickness that is true, Jesus promises that there will come a day. Where if someone passes away at 100, as Isaiah says, they will be viewed as a young child. There will come a day where no more tears exist, where no more sickness exists. That's the final picture. That's the final hope. We give people a hope that there's something greater. And when we live a life of love, a life of faith, and a life of hope, following after the model and example of Paul, the apostles, and ultimately of Jesus Christ himself, that is the message that we bring to the world. And it's greater than any message of fear, any message of anger, any message of frustration. And it is what motivates us to live a pure life and a holy. And it's what motivates us to forgive others around. Because until Jesus comes back, our brothers and our sisters are still going to fail. They're still going to mess up. But the faith, hope, and love is what causes us to be able to forgive, to love, and to move forward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, we worship you, we adore you. We ask that our hearts will be transformed, that we will live lives of faith, love, and hope, that we will live life producing works, labors, and that we will be enduring and long-suffering. Thank you for your love and for your truth. Help us to bring it to others today and always. And let us be able to find our rest and our peace in you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.